the desert to be tempted by the devil. <clears throat> if you compare this, I've all, and, and I, I always like to point it out, though we're not going to jump over and look at Mark's account. Uh, when Mark talks about this uh, temptation of Jesus, when he talks about the role of the Spirit, he uses a stronger word. And it's a word that can be translated something like uh, kicked out into the wilderness. <laughs> and commentators have really spun a lot of words on trying to figure out why Mark uses a stronger word than, uh, than Matthew does. And I don't know that there's any good answer to it, but it certainly lends itself to a whole lot of fascinating thoughts. Yeah, Tom? More interesting, more interesting question why the Spirit do that? Thank you for raising that because I was kind of headed in that direction. Well, since you raised it, what do you think might be an answer? I don't know. It seems strange that the Spirit, who should be looking out for certainly Jesus' best interest, would throw him into the lion's den to be tempted. Well, by Satan. I mean, that's just. Well, let, let me use your words, because I think you, you probably have said more than you realize. Could it be that the Spirit did lead him out there precisely for his best interests? This, this also answers the same thing, uh, what Jesus said when he came to John to be baptized, to fulfill all righteousness. Yes, it's part of, yes, it's part of that, exactly. Because remember when we talked about that expression, to fulfill all righteousness? Uh, there's a lot of neat things that can kind of go under that umbrella of that phrase. But this would be certainly one of them, that the Spirit, for Jesus' own good, leads him out into the wilderness to be tempted. What I've often thought, now I'm going to throw this out. It, it didn't have to be uh, exactly the way that it is, but I've often thought that maybe the reason, part of the reason for the Spirit's role here is maybe Jesus didn't think he was quite ready yet, or, or you know, it just... Whatever reason, the Spirit has to step in and do the leading. <clears throat> yeah, he was. Just something about it. Uh, and, Ma and Matthew doesn't give us any hint on that. Wouldn't it be neat if he had given us a footnote and said, <laughs> you know, there's so much uh, actually here even in the temptation narrative. We wish we had more detail, and this certainly is one of them. Here is another thing to think about, though because uh, it does raise this issue. In Jesus' ministry, God and the Holy Spirit were also part of that ongoing ministry while he was here. Uh, and I have no doubt that there was a lot more conversation between God and Jesus than what we have recorded, and a lot more interactive activity between Jesus and the Holy Spirit in his ministry than what we have recorded. Yeah, Judy? This intense... Uh temptation that he was going to go through, that may have been more for our benefit than for Jesus' benefit. Of course, he had to go through this, but I mean, we see the intense and all points temptation, yeah. but we know that he was tempted all through his life. Right. But uh, this was something, <coughs> I think, I don't know whether it was Paul or Peter who said that he was tempted in all points, just like we are. Yeah. And I think this uh, one intense uh, temptation points that out. It's, it's there for our benefit. And, and I have a sneaky suspicion that as Matthew writes the story of Jesus, um, that's precisely what he wants, you know, the Christians of his day to get out of this part of Jesus' ministry. Look at what Jesus went through, but here's how, and, and that will be the thing that we'll point out as we go through it. Jesus went through this, but what can we learn from it? What benefit do we get from his temptation? Bill? Now, Matthew wasn't there when this happened, so either he gets this from Jesus or he gets it through Revelation. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, that, and see, that's part of the... We mentioned a little bit when we started off. That's part of the formation of the story of Jesus in the Gospels that we don't have a part of. It's fascinating because... Some of the writings, uh, you know that they weren't there in person. So they're either getting the story uh, you know, from others, uh, and I'm certain that the Spirit was part of it, 
Uh, we just don't have that part of the background of it, but to me, that's always fascinating to think about that. <clears throat> Oh, <laughs> well, he certainly didn't get it there, did he? Hmm. This was at the very, very beginning before the uh, choosing of the apostles and all that. Yes, yeah. certainly uh, was. Curtis, well, I want to yes. know, man, I, I don't want to beat this to death, but it just seemed strange that the Spirit would lead him into temptation when in the Lord's Prayer, you're asking God, don't leave me in uh, temptation. Yet, yet here, the Spirit willingly, I guess, or, I mean, He leads Jesus into temptation. He, he does, does doesn't man, he? You messed up on the recording of it. That's what He says. He says. <laughs> you know, uh, when, when you go back and look at scriptures, and particularly the case of, of Abraham, uh, God leads him to go out to kill his son. Yeah. Um, part of what you brought up is a fascinating dimension of just the theme of temptation as it works through Matthew's gospel. Um, Jesus being led by the Spirit for his own temptation uh, has a lot of found, foundational elements to start his ministry off, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, he does provide benefits for us being victorious. Um, I think the difference would be is that we would not say that the Spirit would lead us into temptation. And, and of course, our role, uh, or let's see, our experience of living before God is quite a bit different than Jesus's. And so this is a unique occasion because you'll never find in Scripture other than Jesus where somebody is led by the Spirit into temptation. It's only Jesus that, is, that ever, uh, that this expression is ever used for. But what you brought up is an interesting observation because uh, there uh, is a, there's a specific um, idea about temptation that works itself all the way through the Gospel of Matthew. And I get the impression that one of the things Matthew wants to develop as a sub-theme, which he does, is that if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be aware of temptation. And as he starts the whole book off, he would probably say in addition to that, uh, there will be temptation, but I want you to know that the Jesus that you're walking and serving uh, before uh, as your Lord, he went through it and he was victorious. So, but, but isn't that, see, you, you brought up something that is fascinating because at one level, if you're not careful, it almost looks like it's contradictory, doesn't it? Is a plea to God yes. to not lead us into temptation. So That's right. The question, I'm sure the, the logical question is, does God lead us into temptation? Uh, not in the sense of Jesus. Uh, particularly, go back to this earlier phrase, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was doing something uh, quite a bit different in his ministry. So you think, if, if, our, if, if, we, if we could... This would be a neat exercise. If after we finish the Gospel of Matthew, we took a great big whiteboard, we'd just divide it right down the middle. We'd say, okay, what is unique to Jesus' ministry that we as his disciples either cannot do or are not expected to experience? We could come up with a lot of things. And that's interesting to notice that because, listen to what we say. If we're disciples of Jesus, we want to think like Jesus and we want to follow him. And that sounds good, but, but you got to figure out what do you mean by that? Because you can't experience or do every single thing Jesus did. And I would put this in that category. It's unique, and the Spirit led Jesus to be led uh, into temptation. Yeah, Bill? Nothing is ever really that <laughs> did y'all hear that? <laughs> Why is that? Why can't it be easier? Well, we might pray, you know. Uh, lead us not into temptation. Uh -huh. but sometimes being led into temptation is better for us than to have a smooth road. And the whole purpose of that is to overcome and be strengthened as a result of that struggle that mm -hmm. takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a struggle that Jesus had to go through. Sure was. This becomes the example for us 
we are rarely ever faced face to face with Satan himself. Right. He Not may use Jesus many did. other people or situations or things to tempt us. Yeah. But the scripture also says if we resist him, he's going to run from us. Yeah. Yeah. So we have an <clears throat> and so these struggles, and just like in, in the example that he's a while ago about Abraham, what, what was the purpose of that? I, I think it was for Abraham to understand his own faith. Oh, uh, yeah. God understood it. Yeah. But for him to understand what his faith was like, so that he would see in the distance, never physically, but see in the distance, what God had promised about his mm -hmm. children being as numerous as the stars of the heaven and as the sands of the sea. Yeah. He would never see that. That's right. But in a spiritual sense, he could see. Boy, I, I want to refrain from going off in a direction with some of this is this is an amazing we can make a whole lesson on this the, the role of struggle in our own maturity as disciples of Christ that's a that's a wonderful lesson and sometimes that struggle is because of temptation sometimes it's because of other challenges and obstacles that are there that's that certainly is true he used to be tempted by the devil notice he was fasting okay okay yes yes fasting of course um, he's hungry out in the desert which is such an inhospitable place but the tempter came to him and if you look in Matthew uh, 613 <clears throat> this is the passage that Tom was referring to earlier lead us not to temptation but deliver us from the NIV says the evil one which I think is probably a better translation it's not just abstract evil I think the devil, certainly in Matthew, is presented as being very active with leading people into temptation. Uh, look at chapter uh, 18 and verse 7. <clears throat> and, and here he is talking about uh, leading someone astray. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. And there is this strong emphasis in Matthew that God is concerned that you don't lead someone astray and tempt them to go to a direction that they should not be going because you're going to be held accountable for that. Then 2641... <clears throat> And of course, this is in Gethsemane. He returns to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. How many times have we sort of, you know, tongue in cheek use that expression? Oh yeah, my spirit's willing, but my body's weak. You know, we'll use that. But uh, in this particular situation, uh, the disciples were not aware of the significant struggle that Jesus was going through here. And as such, he tells them uh, not to give in uh, to temptation. And it's not necessarily temptation to sin as it is 
the temptation not to be alert and aware of what's going on. And there's a, there's a really neat concept all through Matthew about discipleship, uh, a part of discipleship, where it says, uh, keep watch and be ready. The idea of alertness, spiritual alertness, is critical in discipleship. That when we, when we take, take on the life of following after Jesus, it means that, and, and, and I've tried to figure out how to say this, you, we are embracing a whole new worldview, but we're all, we also have the ability, because we begin to have the mind of Christ, to kind of look around us and see um, how empty sometimes culture is. And that our spiritual alertness is aware of all the different ways in which Satan can tempt us just to get our mind off of our focus, uh, maybe lead someone else in the wrong direction. We just have to be spiritually alert to those kind of things. <clears throat> now, there were three purposes for the temptations. Um, you, may, you may actually think of more, but it's interesting that as Jesus is fulfilling all righteousness, uh, this temptation experience recalls Israel's testing in the wilderness. Not only that, Jesus provides for us a model for testing or tempting, and we're going to look at that here in just a moment. But also there's a deeper understanding, and it starts kind of here, that Jesus' messiahship is directly opposed to the devil's scheme. And you're going to find the authority of Jesus clashing with the authority of Satan, or authority he thinks he has, and the power of Jesus against the power of the devil. In the first temptation, Satan comes to Jesus, I want you to speak that these stones might become loaves of bread. Well, what was the hook? Well, on a very simple level, Jesus was hungry, obviously. Uh, Satan thought that that would get him. But the devil invites Jesus to use his sonship for personal reasons. Uh, and this may give us an insight into the tempter's view of power, that any time you have authority and power, the best way that you can use it is for yourself. And boy, when you say that, I mean, you just know immediately, you've, you've defined how a lot of people in our culture view authority and power. If I've got any of it, I'm gonna first and foremost use it to benefit me, and that's the way people think may also be the idea of being wrong simply because it came from Satan. And a lot of commentators uh, will make that comment. Uh, and that may be true. <clears throat> but notice, first of all, Jesus' response, not only to uh, this first temptation, but the others also. Um, he says, it is written. And he quotes from Deuteronomy 8.3. Uh, this This expression, it is written, is used a lot in the New Testament, as it, and it has uh, a unique force to it. it. It means something like, it stands written, it's still written, it stands written, and it's still in force. And what it implies, the way Jesus uses that phrase, is God working through his word through his spirit in the lives of people at the moment of temptation. That's one way you can overcome temptation. Um, think about in your own life, in the past, where for whatever reason you were tempted with something, and because you have been immersed in scripture your whole life, a scripture came to mind. You're like, oh, well, I can't do that, you know. Well, it's sort of the same function here. Uh, you have a belief yourself that it stands written. It is the Word of God. It's in force. And right now is when I need it. Now, like I said, he quotes from uh, Deuteronomy 8.3. So let me jump back to chapter 4. <clears throat> If you're the son of God, tell these stones be made bread. And Jesus says, it's written, man does not live on bread alone, 
but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is going to take the word bread and redefine it in terms of what's most essential. There is a bread that you need to have to live day to day. Uh, Jesus probably has had water through the 40 days and 40 nights, most likely no bread. So there's bread on the physical level, but Jesus reinterprets it and uses bread to mean the very Word of God and what is essential spiritually. In other words, the Word of God, the revelation of God, it comes from the mouth of God. Implication is it comes from the very heart of God and it is spoken for our benefit. Uh, and it means it's a personal divine source provides what we need the most. And Jesus knew this, and that's why he quotes from it. In the second temptation, um, he's taken to the highest point of the temple. Uh, in Josephus' uh, Antiquities, I think it's book 15, section 5, uh, he has a description of Herod's temple. And the expression that Matthew uses here literally says uh, the wing of the temple. Uh, some people take it to mean the word to mean pinnacle. But Josephus describes that there's a section of the temple uh, on that side of the city that sort of overlooks the Kidron Valley as he was writing it. And so apparently as a, if a person stood up on that part of the temple, you're looking about four or 500 feet down into the valley. And so some people think, based on Josephus' description, that that was what Matthew was referring to. Uh, most of us, though, I mean, for years, I always thought, you know, it's the highest point of the temple. He's up on the very pinnacle or at the top. Uh, but wherever he's at, he's, he's got a good vantage point, that's for sure. <clears throat> and he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean, for it is written? See, Satan quotes from Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. He will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is an interesting thing that happens here. Uh, Satan, for his own purposes, will quote scripture. Um, I guess he's assuming that Jesus would agree with his interpretation of it. Uh, you may remember, every time I read this, I'm reminded of Peter's comment in 2 Peter, where he talks about uh, some people will take Scripture and twist it to their own destruction. And when you think about this, you begin to realize Scripture can be a dangerous thing if you misuse it. And historically, we all have known that. I mean, you think of cultish groups where leaders have misquoted and twisted the very meaning of Scripture to come up with something like, where in the world did they get that idea? That didn't come from there. Well, there's a long history of people just twisting Scripture to their own use. Uh, Jesus says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, again, the devil... Um, and I'll, as we end, I'll come back and make a point to this. But the word devil literally is the word that means slanderer or accuser. So the devil's all about slandering your good name and accusing you uh, that you're not as good as you think you are. All, ki all kinds of ways that you could envision his role. But he took him on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. It's ironic because he says, all this I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. Really? So does he not think that <laughs> Jesus already has the power to possess them anyway? I mean, this, um, I'm going to assume something here that's a little bit perhaps insightful about Satan. Um, I think people give Satan too much credit on stuff. I think Satan's thinking is much more limited than we've ever dreamed of. There's so much more that God and Jesus and the Spirit knows that Satan can't even fathom. And it's just amazing to me that he thinks he has the power right here to give something to Jesus. Yeah, Bill? Satan has given 
gives us a real insight to what temptation is. Oh, Temp temptation mm -hmm. causes us to think we are smarter than God. Ooh, ooh, yeah, oh, yeah. That is. Uh, and, and even though we know it might be wrong, uh -huh. we decide to do it anyway. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that is an interesting insight into temptation. What tickles me about it is that the, how, how could the devil, he doesn't even, he doesn't know that in the first place. He's <laughs> in the first place to give. Yeah. This is one of those ironic passages in Jesus' ministry that just blows me away. Um, he says, if you'll fall down, prostrate yourself, and kiss the ground toward me, then I'll give all these. So this, this sort of taps into the cultural view of someone uh, bowing down before a king or some power. Uh, or Yeah, yeah, even an idol, but the idea of worship. And so... Um, Jesus responds to this by, go away, depart, be gone. Get out of here. You say to me, if you are the son of God. God has already declared this. Yeah. So how, if he's having the authority there at all. I meant to say something about that. Thanks for bringing that up, Johnny. In my day and age, my feeble brain forgets things sometimes. That's, a, that's an important point. Did you know in the Greek language, there are four kinds of ifs. In English, uh, we don't make those kind of distinctions very well. This one is an if that is expressed like an if in fact it truly is. It's a factual if. If in fact it truly is. And so what he's saying here to Jesus, if in fact you truly are the Son of God, then do that. So it's questioning reality and fact and what is factual. And you might say, well, um, why wouldn't Jesus respond to that? for positive proof that he was who he was. I mean, there obviously wasn't any sin in turning stones into bread. But notice what's at stake here. It's a questioning of the very identity and power and authority of Jesus. See, we have, on, on a very much deeper level, there's stuff going on here that, that just doesn't show up on the surface of this. Jesus knows this. Mm -hmm. the purpose of any of his miracles. That's, that's part of it, isn't it? So Satan, the adversary, is a translation of the word Satan. Again, it's written, it stands written, it's in force. You shall bow down and worship only God. Jesus very flatly says this and serve him. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to find out uh, as we go through that Matthew is going to answer this precisely because of the disciples that he knows that he's writing to in the church. What does it mean to worship God and serve him only? Mm -mm. He, did, he did not yield to the power of temptation, did he? Ooh, ooh, Let, do you hear what? Jesus, even though he comes once, he's going to come again. Mark, is it Mark or Luke, points out, uses this wonderful phrase at the end of the temptation. Yeah, he says, Satan left him for a season. And I have always thought that that little phrase is one that we just kind of gloss over. Uh, we have this recorded temptation. Wouldn't you love to know all the other schemes Satan tried specifically during the rest of Jesus' earthly ministry? I don't think he gave up. He kept after it. He kept after Jesus. Oh, yeah, what a temptation. That would... <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Jesus had an appreciation for what God could give as opposed to what Satan could give. Notice that the devil leaves, and this is interesting. 
the angels came and attended him. The, the past tense verb that's used here for attended him is a, a continuous past tense. They kept on attending to him. And of course, Bible co commentators all, you know, have, have spun all kinds of things. Okay, what did they do? What did he need that they kept on attending to him? Well, you know, I mean, I don't know. Your guess is probably as good as mine, but I find it fascinating at the end of the temptation, and this may tap into some of what Janet said earlier. The Spirit didn't just dump Jesus out there. All along, even after Satan leaves, Jesus has support. That's amazing to me. Yes? The devil left him and angels came and began ministering to his needs. Oh, okay. What translation is that? New English, okay, yeah. That, that gets at the sense of it. It's not that they just came once and did something and left. They, they kept on attending to his needs, yeah. So, well, as we end this morning, here's some lessons to take away from this. Uh, we have insights into the nature of the devil. He's the accuser or slanderer. He's the tempter, the one who tempts. He's the adversary. We didn't talk about this much, but there's a time of testing that follows one's baptism. Notice the use of Scripture in temptation, the nature of Scripture. We talked about that. Uh, there's the possibility of twisting of Scripture. The nature of what tempts us. Being a disciple means we have to be alert to that. And Jesus and the Spirit in His ministry together. And we've already had a lesson about angels in Matthew. But just this temptation narrative, wow. So many things come up that set the stage for the rest of the ministry of Jesus. Well, we will see you next Sunday. Thank you for being here.